Welcome to another episode of Theological Thursdays. My name is Nicole and it is an honor to serve you on today. Over the past few weeks, we have been looking at worship. Uh, initially, I began talking about the altar and I defined the altar um, in Old Testament times, right? The rule of first mention. And so we looked at how the altars are formed from the earth or either stone. And then once that formation happens, then the uh, middle is hollowed out and they use shittim wood on top of that area. They use the shittim wood because this wood burns for a long time, ensuring it would consume the sacrifice. And then the sacrifice was placed on top of that and heaven touched earth by placing the fire on the altar. And so from there, we went on to talk about worship, right? We talked about how worship isn't just a devotion that happens on Sunday, but worship is a lifestyle. Uh, worship is our way by which we commune with God. It is the means by which we learn to honor righteousness, honor grace and honor the saving, the salvation that has happened in our lives. It's through the daily devotions that we do that the sanctification process is perfected in us and working in us. Okay. And so today um, I wanted to, you know, give a good summary of what has been spoken about because Today, we're going to talk about strange fire. And with worship, like anything else, you can worship other things or your worship can be tainted. And so today we are going to talk about strange fire. Before I go any further, let's say a word of prayer. Abba, I thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, I pray that you would speak to the hearts and minds of the hearers, that you would open them up to be able to receive the rhema word that you have given me. May this word go forth like a Euroclide in wind, destroying mountains of, of, of misunderstanding and confusion and uprooting lies that have been sown in your people. In the name of Yehoshua HaMashiach, amen. So tonight, um, we are going to talk about uh, strange fire. Now, when I say strange fire, the first thing I'm sure that pops into mind is the sons of Aaron. In Leviticus 10, we see that the sons of Aaron uh, thought that they would bring something extra, uh, something that wasn't in the law, something that they weren't instructed to do, something that the spirit didn't move them to do, but of their own thoughts, of their own notions, of their own pride, right? And so when they throw up these incense before the altar of Yahuwah, immediately they fell dead. So what I want to look at before we go any further is let's look at uh, idolatry, right? Because when we look at idolatry, what we find and, and the information that I'm citing is from the Zondervan as well as the New Jerome and all of the words that I am looking at, I'm looking at from the Hebrew, the biblical Hebrews perspective, okay? Um, so when we look at the definition of idolatry, we have the worship of anything other than God. Uh, one of the cardinal sins, it is obsession of anything to the Greek, to the degree that it takes devotion from God. So anything that you obsess about, anything that you are fixated on and that distracts you from the worship of God. A human desire, right? Inserting yourself, trusting yourself, trusting you rather than God. Oh, and so when we look at this, <coughs> excuse me, particularly with the sons of Aaron, what did they do? They trusted in themselves, right? They inserted themselves into a holy sacred form 
of worship. It is a cause to be put to death. In Deuteronomy 17, we see that the result of idolatry, the punishment of idolatry is death. And so when we look at where idolatry shows up, I mean, it's throughout the Old Testament, right? Um, and, and there's a number of places it shows up for when people feel that they are in trouble or sorrowed. Um, it shows up with dread or terror. It shows up, um, when people are feeble or when they are weak, it shows when they are trembling or they, there's a horror of particular things. Um, it's, this is where it shows up, right? And, and it's interesting because there's a theme that's happening here. Fear, fear. When we fear. Now, now let's just think about that for a second because we know it says that God doesn't give us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. But when we fear, what happens is fear robs us of our stability. It deflates and nullifies our power. And that sound mind turns into chaotic voices, panic, anxiety, right? And so out of fear, we have all of these different places where it's mentioned. Uh, we have uh, Jeremiah 50, 38, um, Leviticus 19 and 4, and then 1 Kings 15 and 13, just to name a few. And so the issue with idolatry is that we know that God is a jealous God, right? In Exodus 34, he says that I am jealous for my name. I'm jealous about my name, you know? And what's happening here is jealous is defined as the zeal, the zeal for something believed to belong properly to the end of, to someone else, right? So if I'm jealous, there's a, in in a divine way, there's a zeal for something that I believe belongs to me, right? Um, and then when it comes to the Most High, He is jealous for His honor, His holy name, right? And so when we see jealous show up in the Bible, it is uh, zeal, strife, uh, jealous, wrangling, contention, um, safe, uh, safe seeking or rivalry, even ambitious. Those are the different terms of how this Hebrew word shows up in the scripture, right? What we know is that God desires fervently that his due status and honor are preserved by his creation, that worship that belongs to him should be given to him, right? Seeing that he is the God of everything, everything that is, everything that affects this environment, all powers that be, stem from him. And so when he created these worshiping beings and placed his image on the inside of them to be official ambassadors and representatives of the earth realm, and we turn and give that worship to something else, God has a problem with that. He's not happy with that. Why are you going to another source when I am the source? Okay. And so when we look at jealousy and look at where jealousy shows up, we see obviously in uh, Exodus 34, 14, you know, worshiping no other gods. Uh, and then we see it also in John 14, 21, right? Where he says to not love anyone, even your parents don't even love your mother and father. Don't even love, I mean, it says your mother and father in your text, but he's saying your family, because in the Old Testament, remember, you're supposed to honor your mother and father, right? And he's saying, you can't even put that above me. There's nothing that you can put above me, right? And, and we see this example done with Abraham, right? Abraham is a man of, of faith. He's a man of great revere, but the most 
Most High didn't tell him to sacrifice his son just for kicks and giggles. Yahuwah told him to take his son, his only son, and sacrifice him because Abraham idolized Isaac. And so when he brought him to this mountain, Abraham's faith was so great that he said, even if God slays him, he'll raise him. But what it showed the most high was that his heart was in the right position. I am still number one in his life. He still places me above all else. It was a test. Remember the testing of our faith works perfect, works, uh, works perfection, right? And you got to let patience have her perfect work. This was a working of patience. This story is a working of patience. Not only does it work patience, but it helped Abraham to readjust himself, to reposition himself on how he perceived his son right? To not idolize him and understand he's a gift from God, right? And so all worship, all worship is due to God, right? Not even the promise that happened in his old age, okay? Um, and, and then I want to talk too about covenants, okay? A covenant is a legal binding obligation, the etymology of this Hebrew word is bara. And then there's other places where it's translated as brit. Bara means to fetter, to bond. But brit, oh baby, I like brit. Brit is to eat bread with, to keep community of a meal. Wait a minute. Pause. Hold on, Holy Ghost. You mean to tell me the bread of life was in the covenant in the Old Testament? You mean to tell me the bread of life when you broke the bread and said, take, eat, for it is my body? They, it was a living manifestation of what had been taken on by the ancestors for years and years and years. The covenant is the bread of life. Okay. Well, that places things into perspective, right? And so it's talking about sharing a meal, right? And that's what happens as believers when we come into the, the, uh, the transformation, when we come into the saving grace of God through Jesus, through Yahushua HaMashiach, when we enter into the door, we enter into a covenant, right? And that covenant gives us a seat at the table. And the meal that we have isn't just Holy Communion. We are not just partaking of maybe what the Catholics call uh, the Eucharist, but we are eating divine substances. And how do we get this? Worship. Worship. It's through those devotions whereby, whereby we are able to eat from the Lord's table, where we're able to properly wear that robe of righteousness. It's where we're able, where we learn how to Wear the helmet of salvation and submit our thoughts to his thoughts and to cast down double-mindedness. It's where we're able to have a breastplate of righteousness and keep our heart pure and not see the external, but ask God, help me to see the heart of people, to rid yourself of offenses and always be forgiven. That breastplate of righteousness we learn through worship and eating from the table that keeps community with God, that keeps connection with God, that enables us to be transformed, right? To not be conformed to this world, but transformed in the renewing of our mind and the sanctification of our heart, the uprooting of lies. Feet are prepared with the gospel of peace and faith covers the entirety of our bodies, both offensively and defensively. And the sword, oh God, that double-edged sword, it works both ways, right? And the sword where we eat at the table, where we eat the word of the Lord, that sword, it crucifies the flesh and at the same time devours the enemy, right? 
covenant. Covenant. That's a, that was quite the summary, but covenant. Okay? Um, and so, now I want to talk about a place in the Bible where there's strange fire. And there has been a misinterpretation uh, for centuries in reference to how this is to be interpreted. So I want to look at the book of Job, right? And before I even get there, let me just say that God is just, right? There's nothing in the Bible that says that he just kind of picks people out and persecutes them or he picks people out and afflicts them uh, without cause, you know? And so when we look at the book of Job, we have to look through a lens by where he is just. There's nowhere in the Bible that supports the ideology that he plays any, many, mighty mo with the devil. Nowhere else, but for some reason, this book, this text has been interpreted in a way that has caused such a falling away. Not even just a falling away, it's a deterrent to people who aren't even believers. God is a just God, right? And so when we look at the book of Job, here's some things that we need to ask ourselves. We need to ask ourselves, who wrote the book of Job? And I mean, that question should be more research than anything else in that book. Because whoever wrote the book of Job, there's a few things. One, he was close to Job, close enough to know that Job, um, he made these sacrifices every day. Even more than that, he was close enough to Job to know that the thing that Job feared had come upon him, right? Not only that, he was close enough to Job to listen to the conversation that happened among him and his friends, okay? So who wrote the book? Not even, and then when we get beyond the closeness, that this individual had with Job, whoever this person was, they had the ability to hear or witness the courts of heaven. That's why this person should be researched. That's why whoever this author is, they, I mean, they, only other, one other author has gone up to heaven and to other realms, and that's Enoch. Okay, so who wrote the book of Job, whereby they were able to not just go once, but twice they went to the courts of heaven. Twice. I mean, that's quite mind-blowing. This is, I mean, there's no, uh, where else? John, John went in the New Testament, you know, but this is not a common thing. So those are certain things that we need to ask. Not only do we need to ask that, but we need to ask, who is the book written to? Who is the book written to? Now, based on the Zondervan, they talked about how uh, the author, there's a um, hundred words used in the book of Job that's not common anywhere else, right? Not only that, but uh, they also talked about the author used five different names for Yahuwah. Now, he said that he is identified as Yahuwah. He's identified as the Most High. But there's other names that he identifies him for. And he says, uh, what, well, what the author of the Zandervan, uh, the Zandervan suggests is that it was meant for other nations. These were names that other nations knew the, this God by, the one true God by. And then we need to ask, what is the message that he's trying to convey? So he's talking to other people, right? And what's the message that he's trying to convey? Now, when we look at the book of Job, it is one of the oldest books. In fact, this book is so old that translating it was very difficult. Uh, in the New Jerome, he talked about how some of the verses, even words, are extremely corrupt because... It was so old and it's so difficult to make out that sometimes they guessed, okay? 
And I think that's important because there are certain things that we might get hung up on and tripped up on and we don't know if that was the reality of it or is this someone trying to figure it out, okay? But what we do know is that the Bible and the fullness of it testifies of one, one character. He's the same. He doesn't change, right? But this text, the way it is interpreted, uh, seems to make God out to be a tyrant. And he ain't a tyrant, okay? Um, when we look at the name Job, or in the Hebrew, Yab, um, it means, uh, where is my father or fatherless? What we know about Job is that he is not an Israelite. In fact, Job is a Chaldean. He's known to live in the, uh, the land of Uz, uh, which is common for the Armenians and the Chaldeans, okay? Uh, and we see that from Genesis 10, 23. Okay, um, and I think it's important to understand uh, the justice environment that Yahuwah has created, right? He's created an environment of justice, and that environment is retributive justice, right? And this means that um, suffering um, is... In reference to, um, uh, let me back up, <laughs> retributive justice. So that means that our actions can stimulate a particular thing. Our actions, you know how uh, in the New Testament it, it says sin has its own consequence. And so that's what I mean with that retributive piece. So your actions, your sinful actions can cause certain things to come into your life. It opens a door to particular things to come into your life. Yes, there are people who are born a certain way and things like that. I don't want to focus on the topic of suffering. We will get there, trust me. But that's not what we're looking at right now. Right now we're talking about, we're building about strange fire. Um, and then uh, the, the Zondervan, he says that uh, there is no study that supports innocent, innocent suffering. Um, and what he's saying is that God, what the author is conveying is that God has a higher purpose. So we know that this author was foreign. We know that he was writing to foreign people. Okay. Um, we know that even Job, Job was a uh, Chaldean right? Um, and so let's talk about the text real quick. Um, when we talk about uh, Job, we know that Job was a wealthy man. He wasn't just wealthy in the stock that he had, his livestock, but he was wealthy in reference to his lineage. He had a lot of children. And uh, he apparently had land, he had servants, so he was well off and he was quite well known, right? Respected in uh, his area where he lived. We also know that, uh, you know, right in the beginning of the book, you know, Job, it says that he, his sons had feast and they would invite their sisters and, um, Every morning, Job would rise and, you know, offer a burnt sacrifice to the Most High. And when he offers this burnt sacrifice, he offers it by saying, you know, um, they may have sinned. They might have sinned. I suspect they sinned. They could have sinned. And I, all of those variations are the interpretation in the Hebrew. Okay? And so, given that... He, he didn't know. He didn't know. He didn't know. And, and so he, if in case, in case they send, um, he's offering a, a sacrifice, right? Now, I want to go back to what we talked about, about idolatry, right? Because this is definitely an insertion of yourself. This is definitely an insertion of, you know, uh, something else. This is not specifically focused on the most high, uh, but it has a different focus. And the focus on 
is uh, what could be happening among his children. The most unfortunate piece of this is the sacrifice that he offers is a burnt sacrifice. The burnt sacrifice is considered to be the most holy sacrifice because this sacrifice isn't one that they even eat off of. This sacrifice is the one that is completely consumed and um, it, it can be an array of uh, animals, right? It can be an array of animals. And with that, not only that, but um, it's the sacrifice that is de dedicated to the most high. It's directly dedicated to him, right? It focuses completely and totally on him. Now, the history of this sacrifice affirms that um, it's given twice a day. So it's not just given in the morning, it's given in the noonday or in the evening, okay? But twice a day, this happens. And so this is what Job is doing. This is strange fire. When we enter into the part of the text where the enemy um, begins to talk about, he, he, you know, goes up to the courts of heaven, to the courts of heaven, right? This isn't just, oh, a, a tent of meetings and a hangout and, hey, buddy, come on up. Remember, he's the accuser of the brethren, how do you think that happens when he enters into the court? He entered into a courtroom. And so as he enters into the courtroom um, and he, you know, the most high says, where you been? He already knew. He already knew, but he asked him, where you been? Oh, I've been searching to and fro. And he says, have you considered my servant Job? Oh, you have a hedge around him that no one can penetrate. No one can penetrate, right? And um, and 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 then now because this is a courtroom, there's evidence that's presented. When the enemy asks, "Does Job fear God?" That's evidence. That's evidence, right? Because he's saying, "Does he fear you, or does he fear something else?" Does he fear you? Is he worshiping you or is he worshiping something else? That's, that's the issue right there, right there. And, and I know that like sometimes we get caught up on Job. Job was sent, he was righteous and he was blameless. Well, let's be clear. The, uh, there's a lot of Christ figures in the Old Testament, but Job isn't one of them. So the fact that he was righteous or that, you know, he was blameless. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. And this is happening in the courts of heaven, right? Now, we know that the Messiah, you know, uh, advocates and mediates on our behalf in the New Testament. But the mediator, that, that mediation didn't just begin in the New Covenant. That mediation was happening and this this is what's going on there's this a mediator role that the most high takes on and he says wait a minute he's a good guy there's no one in the earth who could say anything bad about him he ain't saying he's perfect that he's without sin he's representing his client this is a courtroom okay and when the enemy says does job fear god Mm, got it. And so even when he talks about the hedge, right? Even when he talks about that, when he presents that evidence, what he's saying is, but I found my way in. <laughs> you know, you, you've done all of this and you, you've blessed him, but here's my access. And so in response to the evidence that was brought up before the courts of heaven, the Most High says all that he has is in your hand. But there's still grace. Because remember, remember that the uh, repercussion, the punishment for idolatry is death. Right? So he, he took his children. And he, he took his wealth. Right? And Job still didn't curse God. 
we go into chapter two and we see the, the second court, right? And in the second court, and let me just back up and say that um, we, we cannot assume, I mean, even though this court, this heavenly court is happening and is going on on behalf of what's happening in the earth realm, we also have to understand that um, it, it happens in the heavenly realm. And so what's going on there is higher than us. It's higher than our thoughts. It's higher than our, um, you know, our ability to really um, understand the fullness of everything that's going on, right? Um, and so then let's go to the second, uh, the second passage. And in the second passage, Job says, uh, you, not Job, excuse me, you know, um, the, the enemy repeats itself going to and fro. And, you know, if you, if you touch his body, he'll curse you. And so when Yahuwah says, you incite my hand upon him without a cause. Now, what he's saying is not, you cause me to afflict him for no reason. What he's saying, now this is, this is courtroom. This is heavenly it's heavenly courtroom talk. What he's saying is, you ain't got no evidence this time. You don't have any evidence this time, right? The last time you, you, you pointed out that there was idolatry going on, that he wasn't worshiping me, that fear was motivating him. You pointed that out, but where's the evidence this time? Even more than that, when the conversation was started in the first court of heaven, Incite means to turn or to direct, right? And so when we talk about him inciting, who who said what about Job first? It was the most high that said, have you considered my servant Job? And he didn't say, have you considered my servant Job? Like, hey, you've been looking over there? Check him out right there. He was, what he was saying was, you've been looking at my servant Job. You paying attention to Job. And we know that, he was right about this because the enemy had evidence on Job, right? It wasn't like, hey, it's point out this person over here because I don't know what you're doing over there on the left, but you're missing this on the right. It wasn't that it didn't go like that. Remember, he's all knowing. He's saying, I know exactly what you've been doing. You've been looking at Job, you know, and that's where the question comes. Does he fear you? Don't that tell you he been looking? Don't that tell you he been there? He was asking a question he already knew the answer to. And so when he talks about inciting, you know, his he is the one who caused the adversary to confess his fixation on Job, right? And then he says, without a cause. He's not saying because he's righteous and he's blameless. No, he's saying you ain't got no evidence this time. But, but, Yahuwah knew that what Job had done, and who knows how long he had done that. He knew that those things are punishable by death. And so even though the enemy didn't have evidence, the evidence that was in the evidence locker, man, that thing still spoke. That thing still spoke. And so he said, okay, you can touch him, but you can't have his life. Right? And then when we go to, um, when we go to uh, chapter three, when we go to Job chapter three, all the way at the bottom, verses 25 and 26, what does Job say? The thing that I fear has come upon me. The thing that I dread has come upon me. What did he fear? What did he fear? So the thing that he feared had come upon him, but what, what acts of worship had he begun to do out of fear? Strange fire. Strange fire. And it's interesting because if we look at, um, oh, let me look at, find it in my notes. If we look at, if we look at Isaiah 66, um, verse three, 
Isaiah, yep, 66, verse 3. Um, it talks about he who um, sacrifices a dog is like killing a man, you know, and it goes down and gives all of these examples. All of these examples are examples of burnt offerings. Because remember, I told you it could be a ray of animals, right? And and all of these things, it's, it's just like how you um, not just... You're not just doing idolatry, you know, uh, when you come before the most high, but you are sinning against creation as well. Okay. And so he goes on and then in verse four, in verse four, he says, um, you know, and Isaiah is speaking like the word of the Lord. And he said, the thing that they dread, he will bring it upon them because they didn't hear me. Because they didn't hear me and they did things that were unpleasing to me in my sight. Isaiah is echoing verbatim, verbatim, um, Job verses 25 and 26. And remember, Job is one of the oldest books. We could take this back to Genesis. Where did he get this from? This is the example and this was the interpretation of it. That Job had threw up strange fire, right? Even when we go to the New Testaments, when the apostles would see people and they would say, who sinned? Because that was their ideology. Someone did something for this to happen, right? Job practiced idolatry because he placed his children before God. And he didn't even know, he wasn't even sure if they were sinning. It, it wasn't even solidified. Like one of his servants didn't even come to him and tell him, I have a fact about it. This is just guesswork with the most holy offering. And we know that uh, Job was, um, we, we know that um, God is a just God because when God speaks to Job, when he speaks to him, what does he reprimand him for? Ignorance. 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 That ignorance is an ignorance about his practices. His practices, the very things that he was doing. He's not ignorant about suffering. Not at all. He has lost every single thing. Okay, and he his body was was afflicted. He's not ignorant about suffering. What was he ignorant about? The things of the most high. The things of the most high. And see, that's the message from the author of the book of Job. Not just to um it's it's also to the Hebrews. But in the Hebrews, I believe it's in the Hebrew Bible because the Hebrews often had servants that were foreigners. You know, we see throughout scripture, there's, you know, a lot of foreigners that are around. And so Job is necessary in, you know, the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible. But Job outside of the Hebrew Bible, we see the message to the masses is... The God of Israel, the one true God, the God of all gods, he's not to be played with. You know, this, this, is, this isn't something that you could um, just bring anything to. There, there's a certain, you know, approach you have to have to this God. He's a, he's a just God. He's a, he's a gracious God, right? Because Job could have died immediately. The same way Aaron's sons fell dead, Job could have fell dead. So there was grace. But through his life, he was able to teach masses of foreigners that this God, this God, don't tolerate strange fire. This God, his, the worship is his and his alone. You can't bring nothing else into it. And so like when we bring that fast forward, you know, when we bring it fast forward, it's the same. Our worship has to be completely and totally because of who God is. Not to get something in return, you know, not, not 
for the sake of this or, you know, God showed a vision and so I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and this, you know, to get it. Our feet truly need to be ordered by Yahuwah. And our devotions that allow us this seat at the table, our devotions that help us to, you know, rightly wear the robe of righteousness, our, our devotions that enable us to put on the whole armor of God and, and wear that in the way that we're supposed to, our devotion that enables us to be royal priesthood, you know, that has to come forward in our decision making. And our day-to-day uh, -day conversation and how we spend our time, you know, because the things that we allow to touch us, things we allow to hear, to see, to be around, even to smell sometimes, those things can be triggers, right? They can be... Uh, entryways to seduce us and turn our heart. They can also be um, enmeshed with our worship and lead us to a place of idolatry or strange fire. Every worship practice that you do should be a devotion from your heart, a reflection from your heart. Anything outside of that is, um, has the potential to be idolatry, has the potential to be strange fire. The scripture says that the people die for a lack of knowledge. I'm grateful that on today and each Thursday, knowledge goes forth in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach. May Yahuwah bless you, may he keep you, and may he cause his face to shine upon you and give you his shalom, grace and peace.